Thank you all for coming to the traditionally less visited last session of the day. The topic is mono repositories. I'll try to provide some mono repo stories. That's why the name is Pani. Um, but first, a disclaimer. So, as with everything in life, as you as you progress through life, you learn new things. And I have a specific story because it's relating to the Git. Uh, like 10 years ago when I was in subversion land and people started telling me, hey, there's this thing, cool thing called distributed version control. I said, ah, well, why do I need that? I just build a local SVN server that is going to be fast. And I said, no, but you know, this is on everybody's machine. So I said, oh, I'll just host it on my machine. So basically it took me really a long time until I first tried Bazaar and Git to really understand what was it about. Reading about it is not enough. So sometimes you really need to try something in order to fully appreciate it. And uh, another thing is like a quote from, I couldn't find where the quote was, but basically a guy was talking about how he started, you know, he traversed from one language to the other. In my, in my case, it was I basically moved to Scala from Java, from PHP. And every time you make a language transition, you always feel like, wow, this new language is so amazing. Like, it allows me to do so many things, but it's not actually the language that allows you to do things. It's the experience you gathered that makes you the better person. It's not about the language, it's about you. Because you gather experience. So take this with a grain of salt, because it's going to be slightly monorepo um, biased, as I've had recent experience with monorepositories. But let's start with multi-repositories first. So what are multi-repositories? Imagine basically that uh, you have a single responsibility principle for every repository. So you have a small repository which contains a piece of knowledge, a piece of project, a, p a library perhaps, and they're very simple to understand completely, like they're very simple to grok. And they have a pretty clear ownership, the person who created it usually. Um, that means that the person who created it is probably going to be clearing PRs, he's going to set up some versioning system, because it's a single library, it's a single project, so it's very simple to set up versioning, there is nothing else in the repository, and integration with continuous integration is banal. And in banal I put it an asterisk, so, so lacking in originality, originality <laughs> to be obvious and boring. You basically punch in a Travis file and it just compiles and it works. Right? And these are like awesome things, but also it, it kind of, it it's also becomes a bit negative down the line, because when something is so obvious and boring, you don't tend to try to improve it. So if you have a small repo that compiles in 10 seconds, run tests in 3 minutes, it's good, right? It's just 3 minutes, 10 seconds, like it's yay! But my project consisted of like 20 of these. These things compose, and even though the CA integration was banal for this one of the multi-repos, when, when their powers combine, here comes Captain through 3 hours of CI. Okay, so what are multi-repositories great at? So whenever I have like a need to make an open source uh, contribution, I'll just create a new repo. I'll put up a, a library, I'll give it a new repo on GitHub, and I'll expect people to be able to clone it. So this is much better than having like Marco's Playground repo where we would create a folder and then expect people to like go into your playground uh, big uh, pile of mess and try to understand what you're trying to achieve there, right? So you're going to have a nice landing page, you're just going to explain what the project is about, so it will be much easier to attract contributions. Also, multi-reps are great for security constraints. Let's say that I employed a contractor, and I asked him, can you please do this fool for me? And I give him access to a repository, so he only has access to that repo, wherein uh, I may have nine other repos that I give to other contractors or I other parties that do not need to have the totality of all the projects I possess. But they do um, raise some questions. So for instance, let's say I have, a, I have a bug. I'm not sure where the bug is located, in which project it is exactly. Is it in Redux or Redux form? Or is it like in backend or frontend? Or is it on the API layer, on the service layer? So where exactly do I raise that issue? Right? So for external projects, like public projects, it's, it's perhaps uh, it's perhaps people are going to redirect you and so on, but internally it's just overhead that you need to basically go through and answer some questions which are not quite obvious. Also, when you have a small repo, it feels tedious to have like a PR because it's just, I'm just trying to do this one thing. Like, can I just not? Can I just like commit to it, or do I need to make a PR so the owner reviews it or somebody else reviews this? So it does sound so simple and straightforward, but imagine that you're trying to. Uh, solve a feature or a bug that spans across multiple 
repositories. So I need to touch three things. I need to touch like the API layer, I need to touch the front end layer, I need to touch the back end. So now I need to create like three PRs to do this one thing. It would be so much simpler if I could just commit there and somehow you know tie all of this together. So you know over time these things start composing and uh, they become kind of rituals. So what is the ritual? Basically a ritual is an insignificant process that is meant for the purpose of having that process. So an example of a ritual is when I'm making a, a cup of tea, I like do a little loop-de-loop -loop around the, with the tea bag around the holder of the mug so it doesn't fall out of my mug because that always happens, right? No, it doesn't. It's just a ritual that I do. So you can sense this ritual if you ever con like it worked across multi-repos, like you build a PR, the person approves this, you wait for the CI to build a dependency, then it gets published online, then you bump the dependency in your project. Why are we doing this? Because we have multiple projects across different projects. But yeah, but is that the reason? Is that for efficiency's sake or for the ritual's sake? We do it because that's how it is. Right. So, uh, because of a very silly thing, uh, oh yeah, I have this. Uh, yeah. I have this also like a this slide. Basically, like um, might be personal, but uh, they're also kind of a drug because whenever I have a new idea or a proof of concept for the like inside the company, I would create a new monorepo and try to set up all the little things, like set up CI, add licenses, set up the environment so it's perfect. But then actually, I don't do any work on the actual repository, so it's just kind of like tumbleweeds around. And uh, around this time, like as I said, like I don't know eight years ago or something, uh, no, perhaps earlier, I actually had a problem where it was expensive because private repositories were not free at the time. This is actually something new that Tim pointed like A couple months ago, GitHub made pr uh, private repositories free. It was actually quite costly for a company to have a lot of repository. So what I did, I, I j was looking at the alternatives, like Bitbucket was nice, GitLab was not on my radar then, and on GitHub I just tried, started like throwing stuff into buckets. And from these buckets, basically, I started actually unknowingly to use monorepos. So, monorepos. The formal definition of monorepo is uh, a monolithic repository in software development strategy where there's a bunch of stuff in one place. And, um, yeah, I edited it. But basically, uh, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Uber, I'm not going to be talking about these guys because I don't care about these guys. These are not real guys. These are like fantastic guys. I care about my company, the way I use it, and I want to present these real use cases from a company of like 30-something developers. I'm not like thousands of developers with terabytes of mega repos, right? So I'm not going to be doing the yada yada truth truth and explaining all the complicated Git virtual file systems. We don't have that. We don't have need for that. And I, and I doubt a lot of people on... Well, in, in Croatia, at least, have needs for this. So uh, this is a monorepo. Um, it has different libraries. It has different projects. It has tools, obviously. And it's shared, because I play with Elsa and Anna as well. So it's meant to be shared. It's not just yours. It's for a lot of different usages. Right? So when my daughter's friends come over, they also play with it, and they leave their toys inside, and they scream at home, but they cannot find them. So. Uh, a more realistic uh, example of a monorepo is uh, Oradian's uh, monorepo for our flagship product, Instafin. It has a couple of components. So we have a build component which describes all the CI CD that we need to do. We have a documentation because we found that having it in code near our code is much better than having it on Confluence or somewhere else. So we tend to publish stuff inside. So that whenever you check out, uh, whenever you do a PR or build a feature, you immediately document it as part of the PR. We have an API, which is kind of understandable. And you also have, like, apart from the components, which is kind of front endy, and the ser services web, which is kind of like back endy, we also have a like, QA folder, which is basically where we pull regression tools and all kinds of tests, which is not necessarily part of any of the front end or back end projects. So it's not immediately obvious if we had front end and back end repositories, where would this go? P perhaps in their own repository, right? Okay. So our repository is currently around one million lines of code. Um, it, it grows over ages, which is bad. We do a bit of uh, refactoring to try to keep it down, so we're trying to flatline this and bend the curve downwards. Um, we committed some uh, generated sources. So this, it's uh, one million of uh, lines of code which is uh, not generated. So this is completely excluding all of... Um, all of... Um, are generated sources, uh, SQL migrations, and so on. So it's, 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 it's a lot. It's not, uh, as I said, Google level, but 
it, it's a lot, so it's not good. Um, so looking at this project, there are certain types of dependencies. So everything depends on our domain, which is in the DSL folder. This is where we put our basically schemas that define the domain models. And then we have backend depending on APIs. We have frontend depending on DSL. Everything depends on the build in order to be built. And nothing really depends on the docs. Our docs are not invariant in terms of code. Nothing depends or uh, requires docs in, or, or in order to build. So we can do some like directive graphs with dependencies of how stuff should be built. So uh, once we build backend, then we can run backend test. Once we build frontend, we can run frontend test. But we cannot do end-to-end -end test until frontend and backend are done. So it also does not make sense to run the system test before the backend and frontend tests are not passing. Because if they're not passing, why would we do it? Like, uh, there's no point. Like, we know something is breaking. So system test is like, well, let's first fix the obvious things. Um, so since we have a lot of repositories, uh, since in our repository we have a lot of different folders and it, these interdependencies, we need to find a way how to, uh, how to well, basically reason about it. And there's some problems. So first of all, you may remember that I said that multi-repositories have a clear ownership. Well, in a monorepo, it's kind of everyone's responsibility. So that means it's no one's. So it's really, it really requires some attention and love for people to understand that there is no one who's going to be taking care of this. Everyone needs to kind of take care of the, the mess, right? Uh, that means like PRs, that means like cleaning up stuff. CICD is a lot dif more difficult to set up. It's not straightforward as in a, is in a multi-repo. When a new person joins the team, they are immediately faced with a large monorepo that may be inf intimidating. Like people are not, you cannot just tell them like, go into this subfolder and don't look outside. Right? It's difficult because they, they, they're like going to be intimidated. It's like trying to eat an elephant. And when you look at the Git log, it's a mess because there's everything in there. There's like infrastructure commits, there's front-end commits, there's back-end commits. And if you're really like trying to see like, okay, what really, like what happened the last day, you will not see it because there's like hundreds of commits there. So you will not be able to perceive actually what's happening in the Git logs. So overall, is it a good feeling? Um, nope, no, it's not a good feeling to have a monorepo. Um, uh, people don't feel that they're independent, right? Whenever somebody joins the team, like, invariably every new person that comes on board asks like why don't we split this up like i'm a front end dev i want to have my like front end repo it's so much nicer i can control everything right they really don't feel like they're in charge because it's like everyone's you know they really want to like take it take everything out like if i if i count the number of times i've heard like oh, let's pull this out using this or that it's like really difficult but the part of the good feeling is that there was no pain right the Pain is necessary <laughs> to have a good feeling. You need to be, something needs to hurt in order for it to stop hurting, so for you to feel good about it, right? I'm not, I'm not saying we should be actively masochists, but it's hard to communicate some things without them, especially the new, newcomers feeling the pain. And uh, so what are the, what are the, why is there no pain? Because there's, there's so many obviously good things about this. So you have the atomicity. So you can make a commit which atomically changes stuff all across the monorepo. You found something hor horrible wrong, you make f changes everywhere. Like you find a typo, you change like just like boom, like blanket replace everywhere. It's an obvious typo, we need to replace it everywhere. So it's a single commit. It can be single reviewed, it will then be built, tested, no problem. You don't have a problem, but you need to bump dependency. I just did this PR, now I'll make a new version of the sub-module library, whatever, then I need to bump the dependency, then I need to publish it, then I'll depend on it. This entire intricate dance of like doing stuff just disappears, right? Refactoring, as I said, it's a lot. I mean, the entire work is oozing with obviousnesses. Everything is obvious. If you need to change something, you don't ask the owner of the repo, make a PR, you just do the commit, and it's going to be there in, as part of everything else. You just ask him, okay, take a look at my shared PR, atomic commit, and just see if this thing I did in your, in your library makes sense. Um, but the CICD is a mess. Uh, but it's my, always my, uh, my goal is to try to throw money at the problem, money being like uh, software or hardware, instead of man hours. Uh, so one of the things that uh, I can perhaps show um, is 
based on this directory structure that we have in our model repo, how we organized our uh, uh, continuous integration. I yesterday published uh, a library that allows us to slice the mono repo. So the mono repo has a certain dependencies. And if you want to build backend, you want to take some of the shared dependencies and the backend part, and you want to build that part, right? And if you want to build the frontend part, perhaps you depend on uh, some QA tooling to run end to ends, attacking the front end to share some models, page objects, and you also need to re reuse the shared part as well, right? So uh, I published this on GitHub's. It's called Monohash, and I will uh, quickly, uh, quickly demo it if the demo gods would allow. So basically, what it is, it's a small jar. Mm -hmm. If you go to GitHub's Radian Monohashes, it's here. And me again spent like five, uh, five hours writing the documentation, which I wouldn't do if it was in a monorep. Okay. So you download the little jarry. Come on. Come on. Download. Thank you. And I'm going to demo this on. Uh, the Linux kernel. So I downloaded this kernel, it's uh, a couple hundred megs, 800 megs. And what I'm going to do, I'm basically going to run monohash on this repo. I'll create a, hashing, a hash plan called monohash. And I'll say that I want to include everything. This is basically, this means like include everything in here. So I'm going to say java jar monohash at code Linux. Okay. So what it does, it traverses through the entire project. It's not, um, I will admit, that it's not, not, uh, not slow, 9,000 files per second. So basically it hashed 800 megabytes in seven seconds, which is nice. So 63,000 files and it produces a hash. So that was the entire repo. But we don't want the entire repo to invalidate if you change something in the documentation, right? You want to whitelist stuff and blacklist stuff, much like Git Ignore does. So what you'll do, Let's say that I'm building a repository which depends on sound and security for some reason. So what you'll do, I'll do you'll just say sound, security, and just basically you can see now that the hashing part took, well, nothing, like 200 milliseconds, and it produces an export file, if you want, which shows that basically we hash the security and the sound. Right. So now you can imagine how easy it is to set up such kind of hashing algorithm that's going to be run on your CI CD that basically whitelists and blacklists stuff so that you can have triggers depending on which part of the project changed. But not only that, this, uh, this type of, uh, this, uh, this isn't just uh, useful for mono repositories. Let's say you only have backend. It's just a single project. And let's say you change something in the tests. You add a new regression suite or a test. If you use proper hashing separation between build and test, you don't need to build the build, right? You don't need to build the runtime components. You can just rebuild the test and run the test, right? You don't need to create a new artifact for the backend. So even if you don't use monorepos, I think it's very wise to set up distributed hashing to exclude some of these like documentations and other like text files and basically to have separation between build and test. It will optimize your builds. But in a multi-repo, if you just execute in a couple of minutes, there is no need to do these things, right? Okay. Um, let's go continue. So that uh, there is not to say that there are no bad things about mo mono repos. I already said like uh, not like some of these things, but there's a couple of weekly what the hells or what the happies, as we call them. So for instance, accidental pushes. So when somebody makes a mess in the mono repo, everybody sees it. Uh, we recently have old tags propagating back to the brand, uh, back to our main, uh, well, single repository, because the mess is not contained into one part of the project. Whatever happens in the mono repo, everyone feels it. Somebody commits a large set of jars for whatever reason, yep, that's in there, right? You don't want to do like git filter branch to filter out this because then you lose some history or some other things. So, Suggestion set up rights. Use a Git server, not just some cloud solution, so that you can set up clear auditing rights, who can do stuff, and that you can ban some stuff like this. Then, for instance, 
Uh, in the QA, a person added uh, some LF, uh, added LFS uh, as dependencies so that they can publish a large set of binaries without jeopardizing the the Git. So they publish hundreds of megabytes of binaries in there, archives for regression tests, and then my GitHub croaked. I could no longer ch work on the code because someone in QA added binaries because my LFS was not working on Windows then I could not even check out the code. It's crazy, right? So the work was completely independent of me, didn't work. So that's bad. I said that it's easy to refactor everywhere, right? But sometimes you refactor too much. When you just do a search replace and then you just change something all across the monorepo, then you end up changing some legacy fixtures that should not be changed, right? Which were not part of your project. I frequently change stuff in legacy parts of the system that you're not even compiling. They're just there for like posterity purposes. We should delete those. Okay. Um, so stringly typed refactorings are a pain. They're not strongly typed. Then you have stuff like, you have like Macs versus Linuxes and uh, Windows as well. Windows is like, um, not hipster, but uh, it's, a uh, it's a case insensitive uh, file system, while uh, Linux is case sensitive. So then you have someone in uh, backend publishing a change in the file name from uppercase to lowercase, and then this starts flip-flopping on somebody else's in front and on a Mac. They don't, have, they don't know what's going on, but they're constantly deleting the file, deleting the file. When in fact Git is going, hey, why, why did you not commit the fool with the big F? I don't know what's happening, right? So if this was contained inside the front-end repository, this would not happen because they wouldn't be checking it out. They would just, like, you know, they would just be doing their thing and depending on a, on a rep repository either by a dependency or artifact. And all kinds of crazy stuff like this was like last week, uh, uh, a friend like... Uh, colleague uh, version the antivirus test file we were doing a feature called like antivirus support blah blah and he uh, uh, he added a file with a test string that says antivirus test files which causes every antivirus on the world to like explode and say like ah oh, this is a virus and this basically is completely preventing you to check out the project because the git gets terminated with could not access file disk EO exception something something right so again if this antivirus was a repository like a Look, separate service that was just contained the antivirus part, I would never even see that test file because it wouldn't be part of the monorepo. So, as amazing as it was, you do get this really weekly what the hells. So, stuff to think about. But I'm trying to mix good and bad things, but I think the, the biggest good thing, as I already said about obviousness and no pain, is that entire classes of issues are disappearing when you use a monorepo. Everything becomes obvious. And all the Loch Ness monsters and UFOs that have disappeared after the appearance of mobile cell phones and cameras, right? That's something that you don't read about in newspapers. Loch Ness monsters still not found. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't get these things. You don't feel the pain because there is no pain. And it's much harder to ritualize because things are on a different level. If it's on the company level, like the monorepo, then you set up processes that are not for the purpose of processes. They're a purpose to really help developers because they got burned and they want to establish a process. So having a PR on the monorepo, good thing. Having a PR on every multi-repo, mm, probably overkill. Right? So it's definitely uh, much better to have a single process than multiple different ones. Um, I've put in some after reading. I said I will not talk about the things I don't have experience with, but you can look into it. There are some tools that are used when you have like gloriously big monorepos. These are like above millions of lines of code, such as Google's. Microsoft has, I think, a terabyte. It's crazy. So there are, there are really nice tools that work with monorepos. And there are some alternatives to monorepos where you can simulate monorepo behavior by having uh, multiple repos that conjoin them, like for instance, usage of smart git sub tree, or having PR automation that basically on a commit, then it basically creates a synthetic repository with all the things together or all the things separate. As you saw with the mono hashing, you can make a white list of folders, and then on every commit, you can, for instance, extract all the necessary files. Whoop. Nice. You can extract all the necessary files into their own repository where you have a specialized Travis setup. Since I have five minutes and this is the last slide, I'll do a Q&A Q &A if there are some questions. Come on, stupid question. You make me feel bad. 
You have a question. The question is, can we go home now? Okay. Uh, then I'll have some parting remarks. Um, as I said, with the subversion Git thing, unfortunately, it's not easy to try a monorepo. You need to actually do a deep dive. It's, there is no easy way to, for you to say, oh, we're going to try monorepos for a week. It doesn't work like that. Like you really need to drink the Kool-Aid in order to feel what it is to have the entire company share PRs and see what the other people are doing in the monorepo. It's not something that you can easily try. It's something that needs investment in time, and it's not easy to just evaluate it for a week. Right? Because of the changes to workflow, the changes how you perceive things, and the loss of rituals that you might have in this shared repo. So I highly recommend you to push for those things that are your pain points, where you're constantly saying, why are we doing this, why are we doing this? Because then, in difference to people who already inherited my repo, you will have a good feeling, because you will get rid of that pain. And that is not to say that multi-repos do not serve their purposes already mentioned regarding security and open source projects. And that's it. Thanks. <laughs>